good evening everyone thank you for attending this session and our uh, cmap and ultrasound and uh, let me at the outset thank indian society of critical care medicine hyderabad chapter and the apollo hospitals group for uh, giving me this opportunity to take this session for you today we'll be discussing about the role of point of care ultrasound in a patient presenting with shock to you either in an er or icu and uh, would be going in a case based approach uh, we'll be discussing some scenarios we'll make it interesting with you for by playing some clippings ask you the questions at any point of time if you have any queries uh, kindly type your questions in the chat box and reach out to us and we'll be answering at the end of the session so always remember however powerful you have a weapon and however advanced the technology you have it unless until you know when to use it and how to use it you actually don't know whether it belongs to you or your enemy so this is a very famous adage and uh, it applies to your ultrasound machine in your icu as well so see this scenario uh, middle aged female uh, known diabetic and hypertensive uh, on regular treatment presents to the emergency with generalized weakness abdominal pain and shortness of breath so what do you think at the situation on arrival she is conscious and oriented but she is tachycardic her respiratory rate is around 34 tachycardic tachypneic hypotensive hypoxic as well as her sugars are on the higher side almost 430 okay so what is your approach at this point of time just keep playing this scenario at every juncture of this presentation and try at the end of the presentation you need to actually no uh, come back and apply your technology in this situation when the er physician has taken her ecg this is her ecg as you can see she is tachycardic there's a t wave inversions there are changes in the st segments uh, in the inferior leads there is a symmetrical st depressions as well whereas in the avr there's an st inversion so is there a possibility of acute coronary syndrome yeah definitely it's a, there's a possibility is there a possibility of pulmonary embolism in this patient at this point of time definitely there's a possibility because she is hypercoagulable uh, dehydrated definitely there's a possibility and uh, her abg basically shows the severe acidosis uh, high and anga acidosis as of now and her lactate seems to be one reasonably under control so what is your approach what are the differential diagnosis for this patient at this point of time so she is tachycardic hypotensive hypoxic okay not feeling well as of now your goals would be to in our presentation your goals would be to assess her reasons for high hypotension and uh, ways of management of this patient if you ask me there are n number of possibilities uh, for her hypotension it could be a cardiac condition she may have developed an acute coronary syndrome and cardiogenic shock or uh, there may be a possibility of uh, pulmonary embolism and obstructive shock on the right side or there may be an associated septic shock uh, the sepsis might have frustrated her disarray of the sugars and that may be driving a septic shock in the background there may be some other uh, type of shock as well as you come to the next uh, phases uh, so all these things are possibility as of now and her urine ketone bodies are also positive so she, any patient in a dk with this presentation is all possibilities are there and when you are stressed up in a specific patient and you don't have much time and there then you need to see how to actually simplify the approach with your point of care ultrasound unfortunately this patient became unresponsive and had a cardiac arrest so this is her rhythm as you could see she developed a broad complex tachycardia ventricular tachycardia uh, they given uh, shock gametron and what not and they basically resuscitated the patient after 15 minutes of cpr how can you use the ultrasound in a patient here also you can use the point of care ultrasound in a patient who had a cardiac arrest so you need to again at every point of time the uh, the whole take home point for you in this case scenario is any new development the patient you need to make use of point of care ultrasound and start from top and come to the bottom in a specific protocol and assess the causes of it and you focus kevin help you in resuscitation of the patient again focus can help you in this patient when the patient was intubated you can assess the airway ultrasound as was uh, told in the uh, lecture yesterday you can use the focus for the intubation assessment of the airway patency and even after the post rosc post resuscitation the patient continues to be hypotensive 
so here again the point is again you need to come back to the basis and again assess the causes of the shock you cannot completely think in your mind and fix in your mind that this is a cardiogenic shock you can have a new onset pneumothorax you can have a new onset tamponade what not anything is a possibility as of now so at each point in the patient's journey you need to make use of point of care ultrasound going forward this patient continues to be on mechanical ventilation here the patient is not responding to you uh, there continues to be a hypoxia again you can use a focus in assessing the lungs and pleura as well and subsequently during the uh, journey of the patient you can make use of the focus for weaning okay these will be obviously discussed in the other lectures but this is how the focus role will be in a patient's journey and your journey along with the patient okay so coming to the basics uh, you need to know what is shock first of all before you treat a patient with a shock and then you need to know what kind of shock does the patient has right once you know answer for the first two questions then you will be knowing the usage of the focus what is shock shock is basically a condition of acute circulatory failure which ultimately results in decreased organ perfusion and insufficient oxygen supply to the tissues whatever the condition it may cause this condition uh, you need to treat both the primary condition as well as the sequelae and maintain the perfusion of the tissues as well and we all know there's a huge mortality and morbidity associated with the shock whatever the type may be and it is proportionate to the magnitude of the shock and the duration of the shock so our whole point is to cut down these times and make the patient better for the types of few shock, shock you have always remember in a concept okay never try to memorize these things you can have a pump problem where the heart is at problem okay either the coverings of the heart or either the walls of the heart the muscles of the heart or the outflow tract of the heart in some way this is the problem it is called as cardiogenic shock where the pump, heart is not able to pump adequate blood flow to the tissues there is on the other way the pump may be normal but the uh, the volume may be less in the uh, vessels so this is called as hypovolemic shock and distributive shock is basically there is a vasoplegic state where the uh, pipes which are maintaining they got dilated and they are not able to maintain the tone of the circulation okay and on the other hand more importantly and uh, more detrimental and uh, more rapid uh, worsening of the shock is basically you have an obstructive shock where either a lvot or rvot got obstructed and you don't have a outflow from the heart so once you know the concept of the shock you can have various etiologies you can have an hypovolemia you may be losing the blood due to the trauma or ruptured aortic aneurysm or maybe you will be losing blood uh, a volume of the fluids uh, through the gut or kidney okay so all these things are possibility for the hypovolemic shock rather than other side cardiogenic shock can be because of ischemia uh, inherent myocarditis second to the infections or maybe in valve failure obstructive shock could be you have a simple pneumonic in the your acl scar tension pneumothorax tamponade thrombosis that is pulmonary embolism all of them can cause the obstructive shock distributive shock is one of the shocks which are poorly defined and it is very difficult to isolate as well so the common causes which can cause is sepsis anaphylaxis various toxins these all things can cause a shock so right once you know that uh, the causes of the shock always remember it is not an absolute entity in a single patient you can have different types of shock right for example you have a patient presents with an acute myocardial infarction and cardiogenic shock he can have an associated distributive shock because there's an associated uh, pneumonia which is causing a, a septic shock as well and this pneumonia is contributing to the load on the heart and both of them are contributing to a mixed shock so always remember this is not an absolute entity right and uh, when you then you can see you have a complex situation this focus allows you to more accurately identify which is the shock which is dominating and what is the way forward okay so before you start the next uh, few slides uh, always remember you need to keep it very simple your approach and uh, most important things in your life are very simple that applies to your intensive care as well so you need to answer simple clinical questions and make use of the focus in this one and focus helps you both in the diagnosis and in the management as well and identifying the complications as well and it is not going to replace your clinical judgment and acumen okay always remember bedside clinician is the best person to deal with a patient and how to make use of focus is his purview
so as we discussed you can use it for diagnosis you can use it for monitoring and you can use it for identification of complications as well as treatment treatment includes giving fluids treatment includes for keeping some procedures keeping some lines or tubes for all these things in a shocky patient you can use make use of it coming to the subject proper you have n number of protocols uh, in the way you can use the point of care ultrasound for shock assessment almost there are this table itself will show you 22 and almost around another 20 protocols are there and don't uh, I, my simple uh, advice to you is do make a habit of using a one proper protocol and master it and keep doing it repeatedly rather than trying each protocol at different point of times and all the protocols have a simple logic so they look at the pump that is hot they look at the pipes uh, they look at the inferior vena cava they look at the leakage so there's a simple approach right hot inferior vena cava they're looking at the leakage of the tank so we'll be discussing that so just concentrate, we'll be concentrating on the most important and most useful protocol among them, which is called as rush protocol. So rush protocol is basically, it looks at the pump, which is hot, looks at the tank and the pipes. As you can see here, it is looking at the heart IVC. It, it has a form of doing scan of fast. It looks at the major vessels like aorta. Uh, you can have a scan on the major veins in the limbs as well. And you look at the lungs. And in a specific situation, you can look at for the ectopic pregnancy. Okay. So this in this uh, lecture will be constantly on the rush protocol. So rush is simply rapid ultrasound for shock and hypotension. So simply put, this protocol is addressing for you the components of cardiopulmonary system. And your simple mnemonic is HIMAP. Okay. What is HIMAP? HIMAP is heart, inferior vena cava coming to the Morrison's protocol, or uh, if you simply put it, looking at the leakiness of the abdomen or the tank, and aorta, and the lung, that is pulmonary, pleura, pulmonary, okay? So pump, tank, and pipes. So what once you know what to look for it, and at the same point, you need to know the specifics of looking at it, right? In the heart, you are basically trying to look left heart and right heart. In the left heart, you are trying to look whether the left heart's function, that is ejection fraction, is reduced or is it hyperdynamic? Okay. If it is reduced, you are dealing in a shock. This all applies. We are discussing all these things in a patient with a hypotension or a shock. If your ejection fraction is decreased, it is a systolic heart failure. Or if it is a hyperdynamic LV, you are basically discussing about distributive or hypovolemic shock. And uh, you need to look at the covering around the heart. Uh, you are looking for the tamponade or effusion. Once you complete the covering around the heart and the left heart, you'll be coming towards the right heart. You're looking for the right heart strain. Uh, you're looking for some kind of oxidative shock in the form of pulmonary embolism. Inferior vena cava, in a shocky patient, you are basically looking whether this, this IVC is collapsible, is it of normal diameter or not, or is it non-collapsible, okay? Depends on that one, your ETIG, whether it is the patient is hypovolemic or it's a cardiogenic shock will be there. Then the Morrison's are E-first exam. You will be looking at the various uh, windows and you will be basically isolating if there's a leakage in the tank. That is, if you have a hemoperitoneum or hemothorax. Coming down aorta, you'll be quickly scanning through the curvilinear probe, whether the aorta is dilated or if there's a rupture. Uh, basically, you're looking for the abdominal aortic aneurysm. And lastly, you won't be neglecting the lungs. You will be looking for tension pneumothorax, pleural effusion, and pulmonary edema. So this is a simple protocol. Just remember where these probes, these numbers basically denote you uh, where the probes are being kept. So the number one is usually, you'll be starting with a plaques view or parasternal lung axis view. Then you'll be going towards the apical four chamber view. You'll be coming down to the subcostal window or inferior vena cava view. And then you'll be coming towards the right hypochondrium and left hypochondrium looking for the leakage of the tank that is hemothorax or hemoperitoneum then you'll come down and see for the bladder view if there's any collection around the bladder and then you'll be going to the aortic slide you will be quickly sliding the probe on the aorta where you'll be looking if there's aorta is grossly dilated if there's any thrombus in the aorta if there's any pre flap in the aorta these are the things you'll be looking in the aortic view then again, you'll come back to the lungs. You'll be seeing the pulmonary view quickly on the 
right side and left side here you will be looking for the lung points you will be looking for the collections and the pulmonary edema that is b lines okay if you have a specific situation like a possible ectopic pregnancy or possible dvt then you will be completing your exam looking for the ectopic pregnancy and the non compressible large limb veins so explaining to you what do you want to see in the heart you first look for the pericardial effusion whether it is there or not there uh, will i'll be showing you some clips if the pericardial effusion is there then your point is whether uh, this heart is in a tamponade or not okay is there a possibility of atrial collapse or the ventricular collapse if that is there or not there then you'll quickly come to the second step that is contractility right heart and left heart and once you assess the left heart contractility by assessing your ejection fraction uh the usual rule of thumb is uh, uh, instead of calculating the numbers always go for an eyeball view okay uh, it usually it correlates with your rejection fraction then you have time you calculate the velocity time integral uh, i'll be explaining to you and right heart the both the shape of the chambers and whereas the function the ejection fraction or the contractility of the chamber both of them are important in the right heart so in the covering of the heart in the first part as i told you when you see the plax view or the apical four chamber view you are basically assessing for the collection in the pericardium as you know the first panel shows you the tamponade physiology basically rather than the amount of the fluid that accumulates in the pericardium the rapidity of the accumulation is very important even though there's a small volume of the fluid if it accumulates very fastly as you can see in so it is going to be detrimental it is going to cause a shock on the right side and the top upper chamber as you can see uh, once you have an uh, elevated intrapericardial pressure it is going to compress and it is going to cause a diastolic uh, rv collapse and systolic cardiac collapse as you can see on the right side the systolic cardiac collapse occurs fast early that is which is the earliest sign of tamponade there is a diastolic right uh, ventricular collapse which is uh, more specific and which correlates with the duration of the chamber collapse which is a more detrimental sign and uh, if you have an uh, pericardial tamponade other signs which you can make use of is plethoric inferior vena cava which can be present in any uh, pump failure also on the right side you can make use of the surrogate for pulses paradoxes you all know there will be a possibility of pulses paradoxes clinically in the point of care ultrasound the, the surrogate is called as doppler as you can see here if you keep a probe there okay you all uh, know about how to calculate tap c and map c in the same way if you keep a probe there and if you keep a doppler you can see in the expiration and inspiration there's a huge variation between the jet waves okay if you during the inspiration if this variance is more than 25% with the decrease is more than 25% on the mitral valve side or if it is more than 40% increase on the tricuspid valve side uh, it is basically a surrogate of pulses paradoxes and the patient is collapsing fastly okay so that is how you assess the covering of the heart so go through this uh, video so as you can see this is a plax view most of the collection as the yellow star shows you this pericardial collection uh, tend to collect in this area okay around the heart and you can see there's a arrow pointing towards the descending aorta so usual common uh, doubt people will have especially in the early stages of uh, training uh, how to differentiate a pleural effusion and pericardial effusion if it is uh, uh, outside the descending aorta it is usually a pleural effusion where if it is uh, starts uh, uh, before the descending aorta it is usually a pericardial effusion so what is this view this view is subsified view you can see the heart seems to be having a huge collection around the heart and seems to be floating in it so again this is another window which is showing you uh, there's a imminent collapse of the heart and you can see there's an uh, atrial collapse as well okay this is this patient is in tamponade so to know whether this is a systolic collapse or diastolic collapse is a bit difficult unless until you have an ecg tracker associated with the window of the point of care ultrasound again the same picture here 
So you can see here in this window, the down one, right side down one, you can see there's a cardiac tamponade associated with a right ventricular diastolic collapse. So once we have completed assessment of the pericardium, then you'll come to the assessment of the left heart, the contractility. So what do you see in the left side of this chamber? So you can see there's a LV which is contracting very well, but almost both the intramural side and both uh, sides of the heart are almost kissing. This is called as the hyperdynamic heart and the, where the ejection fraction is more than 70% and the heart seems to be empty. Whereas on the other side, you can see, so is, can you observe the difference between both of them? So it seems to be reasonably contracting well, but it's not as empty as the first heart. This is called as normal ejection fraction. So simple way to assess any patient's uh, ejection fraction is always try to imagine a pointer uh, in the center of the cavity of the left ventricle. Uh, ideally speaking, there should be, uh, at least there's a, if you track any wall, uh, you should come at least one third of the exertion towards that point. Uh, we'll be explaining later maybe, okay? So if that is not happening, then you mean to say, then uh, there may be a decreased ejection fraction. So compared with the previous two, you can obviously see the contractility is much less. Both the longitudinal and uh, transverse exertion of the heart is uh, decreased. So this is mildly reduced ejection fraction. And whereas the right side of panel, this is uh, much more decreased ejection fraction. It is 30 to 40 percent. Whereas this panel, as you can clearly see, it is severely reduced ejection fraction. It is less than 30 percent. Okay. So the chambers are almost not moving. Try to imagine a red pointer or a kind of some pointer in the middle of the cavity and see whether all the walls are coming towards that pointer equally or not. Okay, at least it should be one third of it. Once you know subjectively uh, how the contractility is by um, eyeballing the heart, then you need to basically calculate the numbers as well. Uh, you can calculate the velocity time integral. Uh, before that, you need to calculate the LVOT area. Uh, it's a pretty simple thing to do. You need to just keep a flat view, uh, zoom into the LVOT and measure the diameter. Just keep a probe there and calculate the LVOT area. It will give the, once you click the enter, then it will give you the area. Then you are going to calculate LVOT wind velocity time integral. How are you going to calculate the velocity time integral? Keep a apical five chamber view. Keep the pulse wave Doppler at the LVOT. Okay. Keeping the probe is very important unless until you keep it at the exactly at the valve area and exactly at the LVOT area, it is going to give you a false value. Then you click the button on the pulse Doppler. Then you'll have a ejection wave and then you're going to trace the velocity time integral. Once you multiply LVOT area and velocity time integral, uh, you are going to get a stroke volume. And once you multiply with the heart rate, you're going to get a cardiac output. So this is the same picture. Just observe how they are keeping the pulse wave Doppler in the aortic valve area in the systole. Okay, you need to have ECG tracing as well. And then you are going to keep a caliper and you are going to trace the velocity time integral. Normal VTA is 18 to 22 uh, meters per second. Any variation more than 10%, especially in a patient in a, in a shock and where you are contemplating a fluid replacement, uh, it basically suggests you that the patient is volume responsive. So once you assess the left heart, you see until now the contractility of the heart and the velocity at time integral, left heart, and then you're coming to the right side of the heart. So you should never neglect the right side of the heart, especially in a sick patient with a hypotension. So here you can see what are you going, what are what are you seeing? There's a change in the dimensions and the proportions of the right heart and left heart. You can see. The right heart is dilated and it is almost compressing on the left heart and it is almost in a way of D. Okay, this is called as D sign. Uh, you can see the pictorial depiction in the panel down. Okay. And this call, this basically when, once your right heart gets dilated, it pushes the septum towards the le left ventricle and this creates a situation of interventricular dependence and uh, the left heart doesn't have that much capacity to expand and it causes the shock. So again, the pictorial depiction of the right, the proportion between RV and LV, you can see that the RV is dilating and it's pushing on the LV. So you can see here, 
here it is causing a severe tricuspid regurgitation as well how are you going to assess the tricuspid regurgitation you are just going to keep the probe there make sure that uh, see always remember one simple rule you should keep the window where the flow is maximum okay here to assess the tr you cannot keep in the flex view you should keep in the apical four chamber view or five chamber view then you are going to click the doppler in the specific valve area any mixed uh, turbulence or mixed uh, colors that basically suggest you severe tr and a simple rule of uh, thumb is if that uh, turbulence or that flow is reaching towards the wall the then it is basically a severe tr in an acute situation so here we are discussing about the volume overload and causing the severe tr so till now what we have seen we have seen the heart the function of the rlv and rv dimensions of the rv and lv rv strain new onset tr and then pericardial assessment and velocity time integral coming down we are, you need to assess the volume of the tank so the tank continue uh, consists basically of uh, first thing is inferior vena cava you need to know where to uh, assess the inferior vena cava what are the normal dimensions of the inferior vena cava and what are the normal variations in a routine pay, routine person then you need to know the abnormalities that occur in a hypotensive patient so once you know how to assess the inferior vena cava then leakiness of the tank that basically assess the the volume may leak into the lungs which will be visible by b lines or may it leak into the abdomen which you can identify in the e first examination or sometimes tank compromise will come to the last so okay what can you see here we are assessing the inferior vena cava normal dimensions are usually 2.2 cm is the usual maximum 1.1.7 to 2.2 if you see a large dilated uh, uh, inferior vena cava more than that usually no the vena cava is dilated but uh, remember uh, there are lot of fallacies with the inferior vena cava as well so all these trials on the inferior vena cava are done in a situation where there's a elevation of 30 to 45 degrees of the patient patient is breathing well uh, there's a good amount of tidal volume peep all those things there are specific prerequisites in assessment of the inferior vena cava so uh, we won't be discussing too deep into it but remember there are fallacies as well you need to correlate clinically so here you can see a dilated inferior vena cava which is not that much varying or that much collapsing whereas on the other right side what are you seeing you are seeing a collapsing inferior vena cava you can see that almost the inferior vena cava is entirely collapsed before you identify the inferior vena cava you need to know how to differentiate from the aorta maybe um, the branching of the veins the hepatic veins may help you and you should trace it towards the right atrium whenever you are finding a vessel and thinking it as inferior vena cava always try to trace it to the right atrium and see if it is opening into the rea so we have various formulas for the distensibility index and collapsibility index make sure that you learn them and uh, if your indices if your collapsibility index is more than 18% then try to give the fluid and see if it is trying to help the patient in a shock and remember the situations where ivc may fail to give you an accurate prediction of fluid responsiveness especially when you have a high p but low tidal volume patient is not be adequately sedated and paralyzed and is breathing hard and uh, that applies to your patient on nav whenever the patient generates an uh, significant inspiratory effort it can it can in turn cause a change in the venous system because you know it, it will collapse right and uh, when you have an hyperinflated lung like your obstructive airway disease and when you have a chronic cardiac dysfunction especially on the right side of the heart your ipc may not be that useful and if you have an associated intraabdominal pressure uh, intraabdominal hypertension it may not be that much useful and sometimes you have a congenital abnormalities of the inferior vena cava again you may not use it once you assess the inferior vena cava then you are coming to the other assessment of the tank what are you seeing here you are basically seeing the leakiness of the tank in the form of b lines of the lung here and it may again cause a pleural effusion you can see the lung floating in the pleural fluid sorry this is uh, i'm uh, very sorry uh, this is basically a collection in the uh, hemo uh, collection in the abdomen you can see there's a liver floating in the uh, there's a fluid collection between the liver and the kidney here yeah. on the left side of the upper left upper quadrant you can see the collection will be around the spleen 
and uh, usually on the right side the collection will be beneath uh, uh, beneath the liver whereas on the left side it will be above the spleen so these three pictures basically show you uh, there's a leakiness of the tank so what is this video showing to you so the right side of the panel as you can see this is a lung ultrasound basically you can see there's a lung point okay in an acute situation or uh, in a patient with a sharp you are contemplating a pneumothorax when you keep an m mode this is left side is the normal one c short sign and the right side you can see there's a demarcation and it is called as lung point you need to emergency uh, treat the pneumothorax there once you completed that you are coming to the pipe assessment so remember how the sequence we came the, the pipe assessment is the pipe in, in an acute situation what we are discussing is about the aorta always try to keep and scan the aorta uh, the normal aorta is around two centimeters in diameter and any abdominal aorta if it is more than three centimeters or if it is more than 50 percent increase in the previous diameter is abnormal and uh, a patient whose abdominal aorta is more than 5 centimeters and in a shock, unless until proved otherwise, has a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. One thing which you need to remember is when you're calculating the diameter of the aorta, you need to calculate from the aorta wall to the outer wall. Otherwise, there, most of the times there will be a neural thrombus inside the aorta and you'll be calculating a false diameter. So this is another view where you can see there's an intimal flap in the long axis, okay, which will again help you in the detection of the aortic dissection. So coming to the assessment of the large veins, what are you seeing on the left side and right side? So you can see on the left side, the vein is not compressible. And the right side again, you can see a clot inside the large vein. Right? You can clearly see the mobile clot. In an acute situation, quickly, if you can identify this, your diagnosis is almost certain that it is a pulmonary embolism secondary to the deep venous thrombosis. So now that we have completed the examination of the patient, we'll be quickly going through a couple of case scenarios. The case scenario one, and you need to answer the questions in the chat box. So this is the echo picture of the patient what are you what are you seeing there so you can see on the left side the cross with the contractile t is compromised on the left side you can see the b lines are there on the lung ultrasound so what is your diagnosis your diagnosis is this is the same patient who came to us in the first first case scenario so the diagnosis is in an acute coronary syndrome uh, associated with diabetic ketoacidosis, it could be have been tested on both ways and resulting in a cardiogenic shock. Now that you have a diagnosis, then your treatment you can plan it. So go through this one. So you can see these are various various ways of presenting and the various uh, for the cardiogenic shock patient. You can see the contractile T is compromised. You can see a spontaneous echo contrast also rolling down in the left ventricle, right? And both the, all the chambers of the heart, LB is dilated, LA is dilated. So this is again a short axis view. You can see there's a gross decrease in the contractility of the left ventricle. And this is his lung ultrasound again, which is showing the B lines. And once this patient's inferior vena cava assessed, it was a dilated plethoric uh, IVC, which is not collapsible. So this is a setting of the patient where you have a diagnosis of cardiogenic shock on rush protocol. Scenario two, young male uh, came with history of trauma, is unresponsive, GCS is low. On the abdomen, you can find abrasions and contusions. Patient is in shock and tachycardic and his hypoxia. So before even going to the patient uh, and pro examining with point of care ultrasound, you know, basically you're looking for a uh, leakage in the tank. And we there, but it, just because he has a E fast positive, it doesn't rule out your associated uh, cardiogenic shock. There may be a cardiac contusion. There may be other pneumothorax. There may be n number of possibilities. So you should keep your mind open and assess the patient. So this is the ECG of the patient. 
Uh, what does his pelvic x-ray show? You can uh, see the fracture there, major bone fracture. And his uh, ABG basically shows you gross acidosis and lactic acid is crept up to almost 11.5. Okay. So this is his 2 d echo picture. What does it show you? So and by seeing the answers in the chart box, obviously you must have identified it. You can see the ECG the tracker as well. So you can see there's a grass fluid uh, in the pericardium and both the atrium and uh, the ventricle on the right side are collapsing, okay? So this patient has a pericardial tamponade. The polytrauma, it has an associated open book fracture associated with cardiac tamponade. And there's an hypovolemic shock as well as obstetric shock. We haven't gone into the pictures of e first of this patient, but among both of them, first thing you need to do is the pericardiosensis and relieve the pressure on the heart unless until uh, you do it, you're going to lose the patient. Another case scenario. So left side of the heart, what are you seeing? You can see there's a kissing LV. You can see the heart is hyperdynamic. On the right side, you can see the inferior vena cava is collapsible. And the down panel, it's a lung ultrasound. You can see the uh, plural line. So you can see the E first is positive as well here, right? In the same patient, you have two conditions. On the one side, you are losing the blood, blood into the peritoneum. And uh, on the other side, you have a uh, pericardial tamponade as well. So you need to relieve both the conditions. As I told you, there may be multiple types of shock in the same patient. So the third scenario, middle-aged male presents to the ER with sharp left side chest pain and shortness of breath. No major uh, examination findings, uh, but he come, his pain is progressively increasing in severity. There is no associated LRTA symptoms. There's a history of prolonged travel as well. Tachycardic, not hypotensive, but hypoxic. Lung examination seems to be normal as well as the cardiac examination. So now comes to the point of care ultrasound. Is ECG it shows it's tachycardic. Anything else? Can you find it? It's an amount of strain on the right heart as well. So X-ray seems to be reasonably normal. So what does his echo show? You can clearly see there's a thrombus in the heart in the Trium. Okay, you can see here. Can you see it? It is the left side of the heart, right side of the heart is dilated, and you can see a thrombus as well. So the diagnosis is pulmonary embolism and obstructive shock. So next case scenario, what are you seeing on the left side and right side? You can see a tricuspid regurgitation. Inferior vena cava is dilated. The pleural line is intact. Your veins are not compressible in the lower limb. So what is the diagnosis? It is again an obstructive shock, secondary to pulmonary embolism. Fourth scenario, known cardiac patient comes with cough, fever, and shortness of breath since a couple of days. She's hypotensive, lung shows crepes, and she's requiring a BiPAP. Clinical scenario point out towards a pneumonia and sepsis. But you cannot rule out the cardiac etiology because she has a background cardiac disease. ECG shows tachycardia, sinus tachycardia. X-ray shows uh, patches on both sides of the chest. Uh, maybe a viral pneumonia or maybe other possibilities you cannot rule out. What does her echo shows? Her echo basically shows you there's a cross compromise in the contractility. Can you see it? And her lung ultrasound shows B lines. What is the diagnosis? Diagnosis is there's a primary diagnosis of pneumonia, but this patient has developed a new onset LV dysfunction and cardiogenic shock. So you need to know both of them. Okay. Last case scenario: a middle-aged uh, young male diabetic hypothyroidism recently has undergone a knee abscess drainage, present with fever and shortness of breath. Okay. This is tachycardic, hypotensive, and hypoxic. By clinical history, you are basically thinking about septic shock. Does this uh, examination point 
ECG points towards the sinusoidal tachycardia, no major ST changes in it. X-ray seems to be normal. Whereas his ABG is pretty abnormal. He has suffered a cardiac arrest and in his ABG shows both the respiratory and lactic acidosis. So what is the diagnosis? You can see the right heart is dilated. The IVC is plethoric, but the CTPA didn't show pulmonary embolism. So still the sepsis can cause this kind of picture. So, so sepsis can cause a associated septic cardiomyopathy as well. And uh, you need to treat the sepsis and maintain the contractility. So last slide. So when you have a patient of septic shock, you can use the point of care ultrasound for, to assess the reason for the shock, which is the pathophysiology, which is dominating it first. Subsequently, you can use it for isolation of the focus of the sepsis as well. So you can do a GA or heptobiliary focus, identify the uh, ETRG like uh, polycystitis, appendicitis, diverticulitis, etc. And you can identify hydronephrosis or uh, pyonephrosis. You can identify cellulitis, abscess. You can drain them, septic arthritis as well. Subsequently, you can use it for a uh, procedures like uh, keeping a central line, art line, LP, right? So you can detect the effect and guide the resuscitation as well. So summary, uh, always uh, keep the patterns in your mind. If you have a hyperdynamic heart, small and collapsing inferior vena cava, uh, your possibilities are hypovolemic shock. You need to quickly roll out the pipes ruptures. Whereas if you have a poor contractile heart, large non-collapsive inferior vena cava and B profile in the lungs, uh, you're thinking about cardiogenic shock. If you have a pericardial tamponade or RV strain or poor contractility and again a non-collapsible IVC and absent lung slide, again you're thinking about obstructive shock, uh, rule out that uh, pneumothorax or uh, DVT. Distributive shock is a bit poorly detectable one where you can have a hyperdynamic heart in the early part whereas poor contractility in the late part as you've seen in the last case scenario and uh, the pipes may be normal. Okay. So for you, the conclusion is it is a powerful tool for you if you have a point of care ultrasound, but you need to know how to use it. Okay. If you don't know how to use it, it is going to become another tool like your stethoscope or your monitor. And always practice, practice and practice the same protocol again and again. First, you practice on the normal patient, then you practice on the sick patients. Always take help of your seniors in uh, making yourself much better. And remember, the situation is very dynamic. The initial septic shock may evolve into a cardiogenic shock, and this patient may develop an obstructive shock because of pulmonary embolism in the later part. So at every point, very significant difference in the patient status. Again, you need to go back to the basic, start the protocol, and again and again, you need to assess the patient. So your take-home message, however a highly accurate diagnostic tool you have, however advanced you have a machine, a fool is a fool unless until you know how to use it. So if we are better than that and try to be better than that. Okay. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And uh, yes, good day to you.